Hi, everybody. Welcome. Please find your seats and get yourself comfortable. And we'll start in a second or two. So, um, welcome, everybody. I hope you still have some brain left after all the amazing conversations yesterday and probably some exciting times last night. Um, and uh, thank you for giving us a full house here and, and welcome to everyone who's on the live stream for this session. My name is Leslie Mitchell. Um, I'm the policy director for the Sustainable Food Trust. Um, and so I'll be chairing this session, but I'm hoping we will have a lively conversation with a range of different opinions about this very important subject of the role of grazing livestock in the future of our warming world. The session that we're doing today precedes the launch in this spring um, of Sustainable Food Trust's landmark report on grazing livestock. This was very, very close to the heart um, of our former um, research director, the late Richard Young. And I really want to acknowledge here the work that he and the team have done to prepare the thinking around this. To start with, though, I would really like to welcome to the stage Patrick Holden, Sustainable Food Trust's founder and CEO, to just set the scene for this conversation and why it is so important. Patrick, welcome. Um, <clears throat> morning, everyone, and thank you very much for coming to this session um, uh, on the role of grazing livestock in a warming world. Um, and also thank you to everyone who's watching this online. I just wanted to say a few words. Um, I have been passionate about livestock for all my farming life. We've got a dairy herd and um, I've been frustrated, I think you could say, that the bad press that livestock have had, has had over recent years has made it very confusing for, I think, for society as a whole and for the farming community as to what role they should have in the future. And it's my conviction, born out of all my experience, that livestock will occupy a central role in the farming food and food systems of the future. Not all of them, but most of them. And in sort of pursuit of that proposition, we produced this report, uh, which kind of was the background to today's session, or it built the evidence base for it. Um, Feeding Britain from the ground up, you can download it online. Basically, it was a modeling exercise. It looked at, we took the, we made the assumption that the whole of the UK needs to be farmed in a sustainable, regenerative, organic, choose your term word. And we looked at the impact on that on total productivity and on the implications for individual people's diets. And the conclusions you, you'll have to look at, but basically part of that modeling exercise was a transition of all the landscapes in the different areas to farming systems which would operate within planetary boundaries and be sustainable and regenerative and circular and all the rest of it. And if you look at the arable areas, we, our modelling assumed that even in some of the best, on the best soils and the best possible conditions, 50% of the land at any one time would need to be in fertility building, mostly herbal lays, not, not only herbal lays. And then, of course, there's all the pasture, because we're a nation of grassland, um, it's whatever it is, 60-something percent of our country's arable area, agricultural area is already grassland. So if you think about the implications of that and, and a lot of land being transitioned in the arable east, this means that livestock are going to have to play a central role because grazing livestock are the only way that we can turn grass in the fertility building phase uh, into food that we can eat for those that want to eat livestock products. So that proposition is being challenged by the absence of evidence, but absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, from the scientific community, who I think are still in denial about what um, was said yesterday in this session on livestock here, where Richard Gantlett said that from his own research, and he's a thorough sort of chap, I don't know if he's in the room at the moment, he reckons that his farming system, which is, I think, it was one of the case studies in our, our model, is sequestering 10 times more carbon than it's emitting. And of course, it's a livestock system, but the grass and science community and others, and, and including the Climate Change Committee, don't buy into that yet. And that's then 
passed down into the public who are utterly confused about what they should eat. And if you ask most normal people on the street what meat they should avoid, they're probably going to say red meat, which of course is the very meat of its grass fed that should be part of the solution. So we've got a massive problem here. And I think that what I've just described is one of the reasons why the agricultural transition is not happening. Because farmers are understandably, if you're an arable farmer and you're looking at transition, you're looking at putting a lot of land into grassland, you're thinking, well, is there going to be a market for the products that are going to be produced? So that's probably enough from me because I'm a person who believes in hypothesis and intuition and I'm a bit disruptive. So I'm not in the stage. These experts here are going to debate it properly. Um, but before I pass on back to Leslie, I just want to say this, that my dear friend, who was born within six weeks of me in 1950, Richard Young, uh, died uh, uh, earlier just in the autumn last year. And he was an amazing man. And his whole life was devoted to the role of livestock in sustainable farming systems. And uh, his, his farm, Kite's Nest, is now being taken over by Rosamond, his sister, well, he was there already with her partner, Gareth. And this whole work really, as Leslie just said, is a homage to the life work of Richard Young. And before we go to the, the discussion itself, we're going to see a short film, uh, which was recorded, I think, just a few weeks before Richard died. I'm Richard Young. I've been farming here with my sister for the last 42 years. We farmed organically all that time. We've not used any fertiliser at all or any pesticides in that time. We've got some weeds, but we think they're actually beneficial. Uh, they bring minerals up from greater depths. They break up damaged soil and they provide seed for wildlife during the winter. We try to farm our animals in the most natural way possible so that they have a happy life while we're looking after them. The calves are all reared by their mothers until they're about 10 months old. We've lost so many small farmers over the last few decades and we're now entering into another wave of mass um, failures in farming really because the small livestock farmers, traditional grazing livestock farms for sheep and cattle have depended very heavily on the subsidy system that we've had in the past and the way things are looking they're going to they're going to end up not being able to make a profit and I think the government is really doing this deliberately because it has a, a sort of strategy which is probably partly influenced by the large machinery manufacturers the large agrochemical companies they believe that's the way to tackle climate change and to reduce agricultural emissions I fundamentally disagree with that and I think for me also we've got you know we're going to lose the heart out of the rural communities farmers who've got generations of expertise of how to look after the land who are farming farms that their fathers grandfathers and even older other generations started who feel an enormous responsibility to go on maintaining that land are going to be eased out by gradual squeeze on their economic situation. Ironically, those of us who are farming organically at the moment are probably doing slightly better than we might have been for, have been for a long time because we're not affected by increased fertiliser costs. We're not affected, many of us, by increased feed costs. Certainly I'm not because all our feed we produce is the grass on the farm that grows and also the hay that we make from that grass. What I think is also overlooked is that with a herd of cattle like ours and uh, natural grazing systems, uh, there's a huge interrelationship between biodiversity and that herd of cattle. Uh, we're in um, September now, and it won't be very long before swallows and martins are sort of building up their strength to fly back to Africa. But why not all of us eat just a lot less beef and lamb, but eat good quality beef and lamb? And I think there is even evidence to suggest that it's got a better range of micronutrients in it. So we don't even need so much to keep healthy if we, if we, if we choose good quality meats. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you belatedly to Richard for those incredible words and perhaps just take a moment to reflect on Richard's thoughts. So, We'll go into the, the hard stuff now. Um, 
the science and the practice around the question of the role of grazing livestock in a warming world. Michael, would you like to come back up and join us as well? Are you, are you okay? Yeah, he's going to do it in a sec. Okay, no worries. Okay. There's a man in the corner who I'm going to introduce in a minute. <laughs> um, so I'm going to introduce you to the panelists briefly, but at the same time, I'd really like to warm you up um, to think about the questions that you want to ask. This is an exploration, a discussion, um, and really welcome different opinions, points of view, and questions around this issue so that we can really dig deep into it. So if you're on the live stream, you can pass your questions through and we will try and bring those into the room. Um, otherwise, later on, we'll have roving mics. So, so do think about that as you're, you're listening to people. Um, so we're gonna hear from each of the speakers in turn um, and then we'll come back to the Q&A afterwards. So first of all, we're going to hear from Robert Barber, senior researcher at Sustainable Food Trust, who's going to explore the latest science and what that's telling us about the role of grazing livestock. Um, then we're going to hear from Professor Michael Lee Over there. Um, <laughs> to dig deeper into the scientific picture. Um, Michael Lee is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Harper Adams University and an expert in sustainable livestock and balancing food security and environmental health. Then we have two voices from the farming sector bringing a perspective of how both evidence and practice come together. So we'll hear from Carl Williams, um, who works with FAI Farms, supporting farmers and businesses to adopt and deliver on their sustainability commitments with nearly 40 years of farming experience. And we'll hear from Sophie Gregory, welcome Sophie, who is a first generation organic farmer at the Devon Dorset border Sophie was recently awarded a Nuffield scholarship to investigate the future of organic dairy and is a passionate advocate for getting the next generation into farming. So let's begin, Robert. Welcome and let's get us going. Hello everyone, um, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you all today. Um, as Leslie mentioned, I'm Robert Barber. Um, come from a hill farming family in Highland Pressure. That's a picture of some of our cows there on screen. Um, and I'm a researcher with the Sustainable Food Trust. If we're to transition to a sustainable food system based on agroecological principles, um, grazing livestock will have a vital role to play. For instance, they would provide a significant source of nutrient-dense food and fibre um, from the two-thirds of the UK unsuitable for crop production, making a major contribution to food security. By grazing fertility building lays, they would help enable circular, more resilient crop production systems um, that help restore rather than degrade our arable soils um, and which don't rely on fossil fuel and energy intensive inputs. And we also know that grazing, when done appropriately, is hugely important for a wide range of habitats and species. This approach to livestock production does, however, um, have its critics, um, and in particular, that's when it comes to impact on climate. And that's thanks largely to the relatively high greenhouse gas and land use footprints of pasture-based systems. And these are understandable concerns that raise a lot of really important issues. However, by aligning our diets to what we can sustainably produce, key to which is ending our consumption of factory farmed livestock products, we can move to a climate friendly food system where grazing livestock play a really fundamentally important role. Um, to understand and communicate this positive role, we need to, to look at and measure the climate impacts of ruminants in a more holistic way than we do today. I think Michael's going to touch on that in a wee bit. Um, but first, um, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to highlight just a few of the means by which greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced and carbon sequestered um, under a transition to a, a low input pasture based approach. To ruminant production. 
Methane um, is probably the biggest issue in this debate for reasons I'm sure everyone here is aware of. Um, I think Michael might touch on how methane affects the climate in a quite different way to CO2 and what this means for how it should be measured. Um, so I won't linger on this slide, but I think two points are worth making here. First, um, methane from well-managed pasture-based systems should be treated differently to long-lived gases like CO2, but also to fossil fuels produced from, uh, um, sorry, the methane produced from fossil fuel sources and from more intensive livestock systems. That doesn't mean, though, that we can forget about methane from grazing animals. Um, research has shown that even if we eliminated all fossil fuel emissions today, we'd still need to reduce methane emissions from ruminants globally to have any chance of staying to one and a half degrees of warming. So how can we go about achieving this in pasture-based systems? Well, there are um, some things that we can do now, including around cow size, herd health, and potentially also more species-rich pastures. Um, and Carl and Sophie might touch on um, their experience of a few other potentially relevant practices as well. Moving forwards, though, um, a, a number of new strategies with much greater mitigation potential are being developed. Now, some of these are undoubtedly problematic from a pasture-based and organic perspective, some feed additives being an example. But I think one area that does seem to hold major promise um, is the SRUC's work um, being led by Professor Raina Roja into the selected breeding of animals for low methane production. And that's work that draws on the twofold variation in methane emissions, um, which you can see displayed on the, on the screen there, um, that's been found to exist naturally with, within a herd. And it's work that should offer major emissions reduction potential over the medium term, providing, of course, it's adopted at scale. Um, that's something that, which should start to become a possibility um, from within the next four years. Um, sometimes termed the forgotten greenhouse gas, um, nitrous oxide is the third most significant climate pollutant after CO2 and methane. And grazing livestock in the UK are a major source, uh, both directly from the excreta, but also from the uh, nitrogen fertiliser used to grow feed crops. However, by moving towards pasture-based systems that rely on forage legumes to supply their nitrogen, there's significant scope to reduce nitrous oxide emissions from the UK's herd, very often with no negative impacts on productivity. And forage legumes can do this in a few ways. Um, first, by avoiding the emissions from the production and transport of uh, nitrogen fertiliser, um, but also from uh, the emissions associated with the application of those fertilisers. But there's also some fascinating evidence from Rothamsted's Northwick Farm platform in, in the table up on the screen, showing that pastures which contain white clover also produce fewer emissions from the dung and urine applied onto those pastures. Now, combine this with the emissions avoided um, by not using nitrogen fertilisers, and this study found that 40 to 70 per cent less nitrous oxide was produced from the pasture containing white clover. That's a, a difference that would be even greater if the emissions from the production of fertilisers was also accounted for there. Transitioning to a lower input, more pasture-based approach to livestock production. There we go. Um, um, could also help us sequester significant amounts of carbon. And one of the ways that we can do this is by integrating trees and grazing livestock, in particular through silvopasture, which is a bit of a newfangled term for, for what is really a very old um, and often incredibly biodiverse practice. Um, that's an example uh, a photo taken, taken by my brother Patrick. Um, for, for example, modelling done by, for the Woodland Trust has found that if we were to grow trees and livestock 
on 10 per cent of our grassland area. Um, as much as 13 million tonnes of CO2 could be sequestered per year. And that's equivalent to almost half of the UK's total ruminant emissions. So, hugely significant. We also know that there's significant potential to sequester carbon below ground by incorporating fertility building lays grazed by livestock into crop production systems. Something that, most importantly, would bring enormous benefits for the overall health and resilience of our arable soils. For instance, um, a modelling study done recently found that a nationwide move to lay arable systems could sequester an amount of carbon um, over 30 years equivalent to as much as 27% of Great Britain's agricultural emissions. And some individual farms have seen even more impressive results than this, including, as Patrick mentioned, um, Yatesbury House Farm in Wiltshire, where um, I'm sure many of you will have heard Richard say yesterday, the move to a biodynamic layarable system um, has uh, enabled the farm to sequester much more carbon than it's emitting at present. The potential to store more carbon under existing grasslands is a much more controversial and complicated topic, and there is a lot that we still don't know. But one thing that we do know is um, from a, a study published in 2016 that English grasslands managed in a conventionally intensive manner, the data from which is in the right-hand column there, store around 11% less carbon per hectare than grasslands with higher species diversity and fewer, fewer inputs under the intermediate column on the, the left, as it was titled in that paper. Now, that's a really major difference, which suggests that moving to a more agroecological approach could allow us to sequester really meaningful quantities of carbon under many of our pastures. And some farmers um, have seen this for themselves. Um, the ethical dairy in Galloway is a good example of this, where, as you can see on the slide, um, soil organic matter levels appear to have increased significantly in the 25 years since organic conversion. Now, on-farm observations such as these need to be validated by academic research. And it's important to note that not every regeneratively grazed farm has seen a significant increase in their soil carbon levels. So, caution is required. But while the peer-reviewed evidence base for more regenerative grassland management practices remains limited, it is growing. For instance, we know that um, increased plant species diversity generally has a positive and sometimes really positive impact on soil carbon, um, with the presence of legumes appearing to be especially important here. And there's also ev evidence globally showing that rotational grazing can have a really positive impact too. Unfortunately, there's been very little academic research into this in temperate climates like the UK's, um, though one published study that I know of from the Basque country in Spain um, did find a really significant increase in soil carbon stocks under a rotational grazing system with long periods of rest, and that seems to be really important, um, at a rate of increase that actually exceeded the four per thousand target um, uh, developed from COP21. And a number of UK studies are now looking at this uh, as, as well, um, including one um, at Rothamsted, um, where over the first five years of a BBSRC funded experiment, soil carbon stocks um, appear to have increased under a cell grazing treatment, but not under the more conventional set stocking approach. And I think the results of this are going to be published soon. So one to look out for. So we know that there's major scope to reduce emissions and store more carbon by rearing livestock in ways that deliver the kinds of benefits um, I outlined at the start of the presentation, especially if, as mentioned, we also eat more healthily and sustainability, uh, sustainably. However, Making the climate case for grazing livestock also requires us to look at their climate impacts in different ways. In part, 
that is about measuring the carbon footprint of livestock products in a more holistic manner, which I think Michael will touch on in a second. But I think it is also important that we look at the climate impact of the whole UK food system rather than just individual foods. And from this perspective, foods which may have a, a higher individual footprint can be seen to be playing a really key role in a climate-friendly food system. I think taking a whole system perspective is, is an important point to finish on. Um, looking at all aspects of sustainability is absolutely critical if we are to create a food system that is fit for the future. Um, something which the Global Farm metric pictured on, on, on the screen is, is working to enable. So, in short, we, we need to avoid carbon tunnel vision and instead look at how we can farm and eat in ways that work not just for the climate, but also the overall health and resilience of uh, people and the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. And, and I think that's the start of a reframing of how we look at not just grazing livestock, but the way that we farm and the way that we will need to farm to feed Britain in the future. Kind of feels like there are three different points there. The mindset and the questions that we ask, the metrics and the way we measure our sustainability impacts but also the difference in terms of farm management. And I really heard some, some key points there just to reflect back again about looking at mixed farming and the role of grazing livestock in arable systems, the role of diverse multi-species pastures in carbon storage, and the coexistence of cattle and biodiversity, and the dependence on um, ruminants for that biodiversity to thrive. I really heard those words, carbon tunnel vision. And I think this is where we're trying to encourage people not to, to go fishing for a, a new way of looking that supports livestock, but to really ask the right questions about what is the future of farming. So from here, Michael, your life is spent asking these questions and really digging into this evidence um, and trying to see what is the appropriate future for both environmental health and food security in the UK? So over to you. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Leslie. Um, so first of all, I want to congratulate Robert and, and the team because that was a really good balanced overview. So um, thank you for presenting that. Um, secondly, before I start talking about my life's work, <laughs> so to speak, although I'd say my life's work is my, is my daughter, but anyway, that's, that's a, a, a separate issue. Uh, I just want to acknowledge um, Richard Young um, for the great work that he did. Um, he's a huge loss, not only to the Sustainable Food Trust, but to grazing livestock community, and I would say all of sustainable agriculture. Um, we didn't always agree. We agreed on more things than we disagreed, but it was the areas that we disagreed which was a lot more interesting in, in those discussions, and that's what science is about. It's about recognizing that we will never get it 100% right, but we challenge, we listen, we look at the evidence, and we go again. And I think that's critically, when we look at grazing livestock, that's the approach we need to do. So a huge thank you to Richard. I remember every time that I picked up a piece of evidence or a programme from um, our national broadcaster, which might not have been as balanced, and I was typing away furiously, I'd already noticed that Richard Young had beat me to it. So it was, I'm, I'm really, really going to uh, miss that because I'm going to have significant more work to do. Uh, but big thank you uh, to, to Richard. Yes, I think, and, and um, Robert acknowledged it, the challenges are real. No one in this room is denying that climate change is real. And just, just look at you know, the travel uh, from Shropshire here um, two days ago, and we look at the variable climates, because we know it's not just about rising temperatures. And therefore, all sectors of society needs to improve. And that, of course, includes agriculture. And we're very much aware of that. 
but we need to be driven by the science and the evidence. And at the moment, I, I believe that ruminant agriculture particularly has been getting a hard press, driven by a metric, a simple metric that was chosen to simplify something as complex as sustainability. Um, and that metric being carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of product. Now, this metric was developed to look at the environmental impact and the climate change of multiple sectors, uh, be it energy and transportation. But when you look at agriculture, it's more complex because those other sectors predominantly focus on emissions from a single greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide. But when you layer the complexities of agriculture, and let's make sure that agriculture is the most multidisciplinary science, that of course it isn't just carbon dioxide. We also need to consider other greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxide. And of course, the simplification of bringing these two in and converting them into a, a single um, equivalent um, is, is, is not balanced. And I'll come a little bit more onto that in a moment, as Robert indicated. Um, so that side of the equation I have real problems with, and I'm delighted to say, and this session is all about how the science is changing, I'm delighted to say this is being recognised. Following the great work that Miles Allen has done at the University of Oxford, recognising your atmospheric chemists of really having problems, particularly with methane, in determining how to deal with it. And again, I'll, I'll come on to that. Maybe that's something we can explore further uh, later on. The other part of the equation, um, kilograms of product, again, I have phenomenal uh, problems with as a nutritional biochemist through training. Um, when you look at the environmental impact of a system, you compare it with the value of that system. So the cost against the value. Is the value of food weight? No, it's not. Are people there? I think this people... <laughs> No, it's not. It's nutritional density and, and, and therefore if we're looking at the environmental impact of a production system, we need to include the value for why it's produced. So kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of product um, is not a just a metric and it is the single reason why particularly ruminant livestock and beef have been singled out as one of the drivers for uh, climate change when we look at food systems. So we need to put that right. We need to do it balanced and we need to recognise, of course, as Robert's very well done in his presentation, that of course we haven't got everything perfect, even in grazing livestock systems. We've got a lot of ways to improve. We need to reduce emissions. But this metric is not just because also it, we talk about net emissions. That's the goal, net zero. Not zero emissions carbon, we talk about net zero. And when we look at the environmental footprint of food items, including dairy, beef, lamb, pigs, poultry, we talk about the emissions of that animal, not how it was produced within the farm environment. So we need to include, when we're looking at a livestock systems or any agricultural system, we need to look at the net balance on farm. And also realise that, of course, when we're looking at um, emissions associated with an agricultural product, we single out that product and we forget that farms produce multiple products and they interact. No farm producing a single product um, would, you know, if, or multiple products would uh, say that there's no interaction on their farm. So the arable system, the interactions between beef and sheep, all of those need to be included. Our system at the moment, when we look at the environmental footprint, uses what they call um, an economic uh, allocation. So the value of the food out is allocated to its environmental burden. So we need to get much better at this. We need to report net emissions and we need to support farmers who are taking interventions on our farm in terms of carbon sequestration potential, soils, uh, hedgerows, NPP, green energy, that they can include that in terms of offsetting their beef at a national inventory level, because at the moment that is not uh, included. Also, we need to include, and again, Robert mentioned this, that we need to be very, very aware and concerned with carbon 
uh, channel visions. You know, that, that of course, sustainability is wider than carbon. Biodiversity, supporting rural communities. There is, isn't a single rural community on the planet that hasn't got ruminant livestock at its core. Soil health. We mentioned, and I had lots of discussions around Richard Young, and my great friends at Rothamsted around soil health. And Patrick, we've had numerous discussions over the years around um, soil organic carbon. But what is clear is that organic matter from grazing systems, from manures, and excuse me, shit, improves soil health and delivers greater biomass production within arable systems. 175 years of long-term experiments of Rothamsted has clearly shown that. Whether that carbon is recalcitrant and mineralized and locked up forever, or it's part of a natural carbon cycle, um, okay, fine, we, need to, we can need to consider that, but certainly it does deliver soil health, there is no doubt. Also, ruminant livestock deliver circularity. Um, and if we're going to think about a food system that feeds what our population geneticists are going to be saying, 11 billion people on the planet by uh, 2100, we need to make sure that we optimise the resources we have. And having a livestock system that can use byproducts, that can produce high quality nutrition from land not suitable for growing crops, um, and can really truly deliver a circular food system, then we'll be crazy to throw it away. So another vital important metric, of course, is arable land use. One of the things that demonizes ruminant livestock, which we hear in the press, and of course, unfortunately, I apologize scientists like me, when we look at land use efficiency, we'd start to demonize ruminant livestock for the land that they use to produce calories or kilograms of protein. But of course, that metric also is not fair because all land is different. A hectare of Snowdonia is very different to a hectare of the Fens in terms of the arable production it can produce. So when we're looking at livestock systems, we need to create arable land use efficiency, not just total land efficiency. And then we can see the true value that ruminant livestock deliver in converting land resources. I mentioned about methane um, and other new metrics which have been developed. I'm sure you're all aware, you would not be in this room if you weren't aware of uh, Miles Allen's work, uh, GWP Star, and the challenges to the IPCC in using GWP 100. I'm delighted that the FAO and the United Nations has now recognised the importance of GWP Star, uh, and I'm delighted also that the IPCC has recognised the difference between biogenic methane, circular carbon, and fossil fuel-derived methane. We've still got a long way to go to get that balance right. When we talk about methane, yes, we are concerned. Methane is rising in the atmosphere. We also have to recognise that methane is a natural biogenic gas, and it has been vital to the development of the Goldilocks hypothesis of how we can sustain life on this planet in terms of producing the climate that we have. But for millennia, methane was in a perfect balance, a homeostasis position between its source and its sinks. The methane that was produced was warming the planet, which released more water vapour, interacts with UV light, produces hydroxy radicals in the atmosphere, which breaks down methane and is so buffered. But something is wrong. Something has broken that natural cycle. And remember, 40% of global methane are produced through soil systems. 30% are produced through agriculture, predominantly enteric fermentation and 30% are produced through mining and fossil fuel leakages. To get back to balance with the natural sink, we need to reduce methane by 30%, not zero. Zero methane for the planet would be disastrous. It would be frozen. But we are aware, of course, that methane levels are rising and we need to do our best to cut them. But where do we focus? That is the key. 
I was delighted at COP28 representing the agricultural community and also the UK University's Climate Network and my own university, Harper Adams, as, as an observer. And there was a really good session by Cambridge University on atmospheric sinks and the realisation, of course, that this is complicated, guys. It's not just methane. There's a whole other of other gases in the atmosphere which interact. But we are particularly concerned about the loss of hydroxy radicals which degrade methane and the rising levels of carbon monoxide that are removing hydroxy radicals from the atmosphere. And carbon monoxide, as I'm sure you're all aware, is due to the incomplete combustion of carbon, be it fossil fuels or, of course, uh, rising uh, natural um, or unnatural um, forest fires. Some great research in Portugal showed that if you removed ruminants grazing the leaf litter, you significantly increased the risk of forest fires. The analysis which was carried out is saying, actually, in terms of the carbon balance, you need to keep those ruminants in that system, not just because of carbon dioxide emitted through grazing uh, fires, uh, grazing those woodlands, but also the carbon monoxide emitted, which is removing the hydroxy radicals. I could spend all day, and of course Leslie's getting concerned now, because and anyone who knows me knows I could spend all day uh, talking about the nutritional value of uh, animal source foods. Um, and, and when we talk about um, um, allocating environmental burden, and of course we know there's challenges, we acknowledge that, we have to relate it to um, um, uh, nutritional value. We need to call out every time we see kilograms of product and say that is not right. We also need to call out when we see animal source foods compared to calories, because we don't consource, consume animal source foods for calories. We consume them for um, um, bioavailable protein, um, fantastic essential amino acids balance, and key micronutrients that they contain. And so, of course, we need to allocate that, and a lot of research that in my group uh, has been uh, looking into that. I also want to comment, and Robert, thank you for raising it and putting up um, the work that we did at Rothamsted on, 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 on clovers and nitrous oxide emissions. I think this is really, really important as well. Um, some of the key challenges that we have with the IPCC and national inventories are around emission factors. And as I said, uh, I was delighted when it's recognised that biogenic methane has been shown to be different to fossil methane. I still think there's significant work that needs to be done in adopting GWP star, but we can, we can live with GWP 100 with improving efficiency within our agricultural systems. One of the biggest challenges we have is nitrous oxide, um, because the emission factors are simply wrong. Um, and the work at Rothamsted has shown that, particularly within grazing livestock systems, utilising legumes and different um, um, plants with different um, root exudates that impact nitrous oxide emissions. Also, and I'll point you, Robert, if you haven't seen it, to the great work that um, David Chandler's done at uh, University of Bangor, um, looking at nitrous oxide emissions, particularly in the uplands, um, and, and really challenging a lot of those emission factors. Uh, because I mean, if we look at greenhouse gases, I'm increasingly concerned, number one, of course, with carbon dioxide from fossil fuels. Number two, methane, but associated with the loss of zinc, hydroxy radicals. Uh, and number three, nitrous oxide. And, and we need to get that right. So I, I suppose, Leslie, before I hand back to, to yourself for further possible questions, because I don't know how long I've talked. Everyone who knows me knows I don't know how long I've talked. <laughs> Um, is we need an evidence-based approach uh, for the future of food systems. Clearly, uh, ruminants have a role to play. I hear some, you know, of, of, of the naysayers talk about, you know, and I think you even said yourself, Robert, about um, a world without fossil fuels. I'd actually challenge you on that, in that in a world without fossil fuels, I don't think we would care about burping cows. Um, because we need to get back to natural cycles and we need a 30% reduction in methane. So we need to be cognizant of that. But of course, and we are moving to a world without fossil fuels. I think we'd all agree we want to be there a lot quicker. Um, so we need to improve our systems, but we need to be very careful what we throw away whilst we get there. And we need to protect and be clear. 
So we need an evidence-based approach. We need to call out naysayers and individuals either ideological viewpoints um, and have an evidence-based approach. Leslie. Thank you, Michael. Um, I've got a PhD, but I always feel like I need another one to understand some of this stuff. So um, it's, it is hugely complex. And I think that I just come back to the first thing that I heard you say, which is that we got in this mess because we were looking to simplify our understanding of the impacts of what we eat, what we do, and so on as, as human beings. Um, and that that is what has got us into this mess. And it always comes back to me when you look at those measures of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent impacts and what's the best thing to consume sugary drinks you know are we all going to live off of that mm. so i think that that always gives the lie to that that challenge um that uh, you know that that is the answer and it is that simple and that's why we should reduce um or get rid of ruminants I want to just change the pace now a little bit um, and look at this both from the, side, the point of view of research and evidence, but also practice and management. And we have two fantastic farmers here. Um, so I'm going to go to Carl first, if, if I may. Um, Carl, you and the team at FAI are really across both that research and practice change, um, evidence-based practice change space. And I just wonder if you could share for a few minutes what you're seeing as the potential sort of opportunities, challenges, what you've learnt through the, the work that you've been doing. Yeah, great. Thanks, Leslie. I think um, I'm never one to be short of um, throwing a few stats out there. Um, <clears throat> at the, yeah, I had a look at some of the figures yesterday and I think working with some of our clients and obviously yeah, understanding the challenges at, at farm level, I think this carbon tunnel vision is, is a massive risk. You know, we pursue one metric which we can drive down and then you look up and then you realize the devastation that you've caused across everything else. So, so again, one of the things that I looked at yesterday um, is the UK, the whole of the UK is about 24 and a half million hectares. Um, and DEFRA define, um, they use a, a, an acronym called UAA, which is Utilized Agricultural Area. And that's about 72.8%. So it's about 18 million um, acres that sit under that UAA. Um, of that, around about 50%, a little bit more, um, is pasture and grassland. Uh, in our UK soils, we hold, we hold 10 billion tonnes of carbon in our UK soils, 10 billion tonnes. Um, <clears throat> in our intensively managed probably arable systems, we've lost 40 to 60% of that, that soil organic carbon. Uh, again, through our management practices, plowing, inversion. Um, in, and this is, just, this is just a stat for England and Wales, we lose 2.9 million tonnes of topsoil a year, a year. That costs us around about 177 million pounds. So we, we have some pretty broader challenges um, than just, you know, just looking at carbon. So now I've depressed everybody. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the farm. So as the crow flies, we're about 15 minutes away from here. Um, we're on the outskirts of a small village called Whiteham. Um, we farm about 1,300 acres. It's all organic. We've got a suckler farm. Um, we've got a farm business tenancy agreement with Oxford University. We've been on farm probably 22 years now. Um, and as Leslie says, it's, it's always been used as sort of a pull through um, for research and R&D um, on the farm. So initially, I suppose, yeah, we were running a fairly standard suckler herd. You know, we were set stocking, we were probably overgrazing, um, you know, housing all winter. Um, and I suppose we, we started a project seven years ago, which was called Better Grazing. Um, so again, this was funded by one of our clients. Um, and this was about looking at a transition from going from set stocking to rotational grazing. You know, it seems really simple, but there are some real big challenges in terms of water infrastructure, fencing, because um, you can get it wrong in the first two weeks of, of trying. So you know, we work with a group of farmers, um, and what we found within the first 12, 18 months 
is, my God, our farm can grow grass. Um, and again, we're organic. You know, there's no artificial fertilizers. There's no chemicals going on. Um, and we found that we were probably growing 20 to 30 percent more grass through rotational grazing. It was quite complex. Yeah, you know, we had several different groups, um, and I suppose that then gave us the opportunity to look at regenerative grazing. So um, we started a project four years ago, where yeah, you know, we we really looked at the farm and said, right, okay, let's let's transition to a regenerative grazing system. What does that mean? There was an awful lot of training, knowledge, um, asking questions. Yeah, I, I come from a traditional farming family. I, I went to agricultural university, worked on farms for numerous years. And that transition, just understanding that transition to regenerative um, practices was a real head spin for me. You know, uh, we had a three day intensive course. And for the first day and a half, that inner farmer in me is going, this don't work, this don't work, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna work. And it was a real struggle to sort of get over that. Um, and once you're through, um, it just opens your eyes to the potential of what we can achieve through, through tapping into environmental systems. Um, and I suppose what we've seen, you know, really what we've seen on farm over the intervening sort of four years is, yeah, soil health has improved. You know, so we, we can see this through the VES scores that we've done. Um, so VES is, is a visual evaluation of soil structure. So we've done that every year. Uh, things like infiltration rates have improved. Um, we know cattle performance has, has improved. So we were probably finishing cattle around about 30 months of age. Yeah, we've brought that down now. You know, so our probably daily live weight gains were sitting about 0.65. We're probably about 0.8586 now. So it's about a 20% improvement. So we've reduced our age to slaughter by six months. Um, so we've gone from 30 months to about 24 months. That's based off grazing and forage production on our farm. So there's, there's no purchase feeds um, involved in that. So again, you know, we've seen this massive potential in terms of animal performance. Um, we don't use any wormers, no anthelmintics are used on farm. So again, you know, we're starting to see things like, you know, dung beetle populations start, you know, coming back a little bit on farm. Um, Animal health has improved. Antibiotic use is pretty minimal now. Um, and again, so you know, so again, we've seen you know quite an improvement in things like that. We've had a um, the savory EOV, which is their ecological outcome verification, done for the last four years. And again, you know, all of the metrics that we've seen on that have been improving. So again, from an ecosystem perspective, we know the system is improving. Um, and as I say, yeah, we operate 1,300 acres, 1,000 acres of that um, is either um, flood meadows, which are currently living up to their name at the moment, because um, they're about two to three foot underwater. Um, we've got triple SIs and we've got yeah, fairly old, um, diverse permanent pasture, 1,000 acres. If, if we, if we want to change our, our flood meadows to arable systems, I can tell you most of our topsoil would be heading down to London. Um, so it'd be crazy for us to plough that up. We can't plough and we can't change the triple SI. You know, our permanent pasture, incredibly diverse. The only thing that we can do with that thousand acres is graze ruminants. That's the only way that we can convert that into human edible protein. And they are the engine of that system. You know, you see what they do, the way we manage and, and some, you know, you'll see some of the pictures there. Um, so again, you know, just looking at that system, it's, it's, yeah, we're looking at resilience. How, how can we build resilience into our system? So it's going into bigger residuals. Yeah, we're, we're grazing about 50% of that um, pasture. Um, you know, you'll see. And again, the way the grazing habitat um, of the cattle changes. You know, so things like when the coxfoot starts to head, you know, the cattle will just nip the, the seed heads off. Um, it's really interesting watching some of this grazing behavior change. Um, 2022, there's probably a picture coming up in a minute. Um, um, that's one of our fields in 2022. So that's middle of the drought in August that we had. There'll be a picture coming up in a second. Thanks, Bonnie. That's, that's our neighbor. So he set stocking. So you, know, you see the difference between the two systems in terms of resilience and, and what is achievable you know, through those systems. So, so again, 
you know, and Silas, um, I'll pitch Silas. So Silas is talking about bale grazing this afternoon. Um, and again, the adoption of bale grazing has probably saved us around about 200 head, 200 pound per cow um, by not bringing them in over, over winter and by keeping them outside. So again, we've seen some real profound benefits um, on farm. It's not been easy, you know, we've made mistakes and, and that was really always the premise of our FAI is we make the mistakes so others don't have to. Um, and we're quite happy to talk about those mistakes because you can learn as much about the mistakes as you can about the things that work well. Um, and I would say, you know, regen is context specific, you know, so you can't take, you know, what you see on our farm and just implement it on your farm, you know, the, the outcomes are different, you know, your, your, your geography, you know, your environment, your cattle genetics, your management, everything is different. Um, and that's the great thing around regen, it gives so much flex within that, it's not, a, it's not a farm assurance standard that you have to follow a set of criteria. Um, so it really, it really allows you to sort of think differently about your, your farm and system. But there is one thing I do know is, you know, we need a vibrant, healthy, financially viable, sustainable, ruminant um, you know, system in the UK. You know, it's really important um, that we, we have that. Thank you, Carl. And, um... I think it's really interesting because this isn't just about farming with nature, but farming for nature. Um, and I was, I, I, I probably shouldn't invite everyone in the room to your farm, um, but it is only 15 minutes away from here. Um, and I just mentioned that because I used to be the global lead on food for Forum for the Future, and we took our entire food team from around the world to see FAI's system, and Silas took us out on the tractor. And it was quite incredible, and how mind blown people were to actually see this system in practice to see how they'd adjusted the you know different different animals so they didn't poach the land the fact they had no feed brought in and they were out over winter and it was just amazing um, and people really went away with a different view of what farming and what what good regenerative production could be um, so before I carry on waxing lyrical and inviting everyone around to your house, um, um, Sophie, um, I wonder if you could just share from your point of view what you've experienced as a, as a first generation farmer um, and what you've learnt about what, what works for you. Yeah, of course. Um, so I want to say thank you to Rob and uh, Michael as well to, for your minds on this all. I think we're so lucky for people like you to do the research that so we can get on with, with the farming. I'm um, always grateful and come away with a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I won't start by saying I'm just a farmer. Everyone always tells me to not say I'm just a farmer because it's such an important role. Um, but me and my husband, Tom, who's in the audience, who's much more interesting than me, but he, um, we farm on the Dorset Devon border. Um, we're organic dairy farmers, but I probably should say we're mixed farmers really because we've got um, beef and arable as well now. But we started our journey into agriculture as dairy farmers, organic dairy farmers. And our milk goes to Arla, a big European cooperative. And um, yeah, we often have pigs running around as well. It's quite a, yeah, one of those sites from books that you often see. Um, but we, yeah, we started our journey into agriculture about nine years ago. We're, um, Tom's family are from agriculture there. Their both grandparents have farms, but I definitely hadn't planned to go into farming. Um, so we're about 1,400 acres now, um, 900 of that is used for the dairy and um, beef and then we've got an arable block and then we actually have some rewilding as well which some of the pictures, um, there were some pictures of White Park earlier, um, we've got a herd of rare breed White Park as well that um, we work with the landlords who they don't have the skills and knowledge on livestock so we bring them and they, they bring the land. Um, so we're doing that on a, a very... Um, a sort of rough bit of land that isn't suitable for anything else really and so we've sort of got a bit of a mixture of farming systems but we started in what we thought was going to be a very um I always think being organic um we were benefiting the farm um by just being organic and within um probably the second set of soil samples we did we were seeing um the indices fall and um, we were actually growing less grass and we, we couldn't really understand that as organic farmers. We thought we were going to be seeing totally the opposite. So um, we sort of, that's how we came to regenerative agriculture. We were sort of trying to look at uh, business as a whole and what we could change. 
Um, so things we've done have been uh, look at the hedgerows and not underestimating the power of them. So we're, we're now there in a cycle of um, laying, coppicing, lightly flailing, and then replanting um, old, old hedgerows and filling in gaps. Um, you know, uh, diversity of lays, so in making sure we're including lots of different things um, to sort of a salad bar for the cows rather than just monoculture. Um, and making sure that we are um, we have a breed of cows that are suitable to the farm as well. That's been a huge thing for us is that um, making sure we've got the right cow. We're, we're on a hill and it's really important that they can walk. We're, um, yeah, they're walking quite far. Um, the way in which we use our muck, Tom's really into composting and so we've got quite a big composting um, operation on the farm and we use that throughout the growing season as well. Um, and we've reduced quite a lot of our tillage as well. So sort of stitching in grasses and things rather than doing full plough reseeds. And we've seen, yes, seen huge, huge benefits in that. Um, and then increasing social access to the farm is a real passion project for me. So having school visits and um, local nature groups, um, farm community network, and we also have a lot of apprentices, um, vet students on farm, because I think the farm is not just producing milk and beef, I think it's the impact it has around it. Um, and then I just wanted to yeah, come back to sort of we. I think dairy probably gets quite a, a bad name in the press, I think. Um, and there's so many different types of dairy that, you know, systems. And I just wanted to bring to the table the sort of benefits, I think, uh, the environmental impacts and social and nutritional impacts. So since we've been at Home Farm, I pr probably one of the proudest moments was um, a dog walker stopping me and saying how they'd noticed the species return, the wildlife return to the farm since we'd taken it on, sort of five years in. Um, they was, you know, heard a cuckoo. Um, we'd had you know, lots of different bird varieties: skylarks, back linnets, hares, yellow hammers, um, and that's just from, you know, the way we're farming um, and creating habitats through the way we we look after the land. We can't overlook that in the role of farming and and having livestock on the land. Um, and the social impact, um, you know, from kids being out on farm and learning where their food's from to being outside is just such an important thing. And I think, um, I know Sustainable Food Trust are working on a really great project called Beacon Farm Project. So they're trying to link lots of different farms up that um, are already hosting school visits so that we can share knowledge. Because it's just a lot of the teachers who have had kids come to us have said that that's the thing they remember most in the year. And I think they're not just our future consumer really but they are also our future workforce so by trying to connect with them when they're young and understand um, how food's produced is just yeah lasting um, and also the impact we have as everyone will have as a, a farming business on the local community and you know from the local abattoir to well hopefully they stay but um, to the local country stores we're having you know not just a financial impact but a social impact too um, and, and the footpaths, we can't underestimate the footpaths, but also that we're, you know, we're providing a nutritionally dense um, product when we're in a really under, um, there's parts of the world really under nutrition, yeah, with the yeah, nutrition in the world, we, we can't overlook what we're bringing to the table on that. And um, in summary, I think we've made huge project progress anyway in reducing carbon footprint while still um, pro providing these overlooked benefits. And a friend sent this to me um, and they said, imagine thinking a cow eating grass is bad for the planet. It's like saying that a fish is bad for the ocean. A cow eating grass is the planet. And I just really like that. I think we're turning something totally inedible to us in grass. And then that is changing into something that's to really nutritionally d dense. Um, and it just brings me back to the age old saying that everyone says, and it's just not the cow, it's the how. I, I just comes to mind that I don't think you can put into CO2 equivalent quite the number of different impacts and benefits that your farm has, whether it be from social and community benefits to, to building out the, the you know future generations and the mindsets and capabilities of those future generations to be able to build resilient and thriving agricultural systems. So, you know, really, really inspiring. Um, we're, um, we've got 20 minutes left, just over, and I really wanted to turn to the room 
um, and uh, also to those of you on the live stream. Um, Andy's going to be sitting here um, capturing some of your comments. And I can already see a hand up in the room. Um, but if you will bear with me, I'm just going to go to the live stream first because I know they will have been patiently watching and unable to, to, uh, <laughs> to reply to some of these things. So, Andy, what do we have as a We've question for the lots panel? Lots of interesting questions. First one. Um, Direct measurements of greenhouse gas fluxes in the field consistently show that grazing ruminants are net negative in terms of CO2, but this evidence is consistently ignored. Why? Michael, do you want that? Um, yeah, uh, we did a lot of work at, um, at, at Rothamsted at Northwick, uh, looking at the flux of carbon dioxide um, and, 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 and methane within soils. It is complicated, actually. Some soils will are gross emitters of carbon dioxide, whereas sometimes there is sequestering. And of course, we, we, you know better than I, as farmers, of the variation of the climate in terms of, of those balances. But certainly, there's no doubt that NPP, net primary production, growing plants on land, is taking in carbon dioxide. And the great potential that we have within grassland systems to deliver uh, soil organic carbon and increased carbon stocks. So there's no doubt there's clear evidence there. Why does it com complete, continually to be ignored? Um, I too have asked this question. Um, and I believe, I've got to a view that there are unfortunately a group um, who are ideologically opposed to, to livestock. I'm being, throwing myself out there now. Uh, into a dangerous arena as a scientist, but I'm going to do it. Um, because from a scientific perspective, you set a hypothesis, you challenge that hypothesis, you look at the evidence, and then you change and amend your hypothesis and take, go forward. So therefore, if you see something is wrong, you amend and you change. What we continually see is the continual use of global averages for beef, um, we continually see the use of carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of product, even though we know that that's not uh, appropriate in terms of the balance. And we continually see gross evaluation of ruminant systems instead of net emissions, i.e. taking into account soil um, and um, pasture growth, etc. And I think the only logical outcome of here, this is that Ideologically, the narrative is that livestock are wrong for a sustainable planet, um, and therefore it's an inconvenience in that narrative to look at improvements. It's an inconvenience that UK beef systems have a lower carbon footprint than the global average, so we we'll use the global average. It's an inconvenience that carbon drives soil health and carbon stocks are driving that in improvement. It's an inconvenience that ruminants are the heart of, ruminant, uh, of rural communities. It's in, an inconvenience that animal source foods, and particularly red meat, are the best provider of heme iron, and we have 55% of young women in this UK who are iron deficient. It's a convenience and therefore is ignored because it goes against the narrative, which is an ideological viewpoint for the removal of livestock from the planet. Um, I'd like to go to the gentleman at the back who very patiently is waiting to ask a question. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you, the panel to directly address the role of ruminants above the moorland line, where quite a lot of the sort of things that we've been talking about, about mixed lays, about holistic or mob grazing, uh, and about mixed arable and ruminant systems don't apply, and where maybe the pressures to repurpose land for uh, biodiversity and carbon projects, I'm thinking of things like the 2021 uh, National Food Strategy, which identifies mostly land above the moorland line as, as, as land where biodiversity and, and carbon sequestration projects could be better delivered. Um, but obviously that has huge impacts on rural communities as well. So I just want, wanted you to kind of, yeah, go up in your thinking. Would you, Robert, or? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I come from a hill farming background, as, as I mentioned, so parents and sisters still farm just north of Putlochry in, in Highland Perthshire. So yeah, farming above the, the moorland line is, is very close to me. Um, I mean, from a biodiversity point of view, grazing in upland environments when done well is, is massively important. So a lot of our government monies come for conservation grazing, basically, of species rich grasslands, uh, fen, uh, moorland as, as, as well, well above a thousand feet above sea level, and, and grazing is critical, critical for that. Um, I guess from a carbon perspective, I mean, you mentioned the pressures around tree planting. Um, I mean, we do need more trees across our landscape for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, I think there's a lot of potential, as I mentioned, for the integration of trees and, and agricultural systems, and that includes in, in the uplands as well. Um, so, so the two aren't in opposition, I don't think. There is some care needed around afforestation in some of the soils in the uplands. Um, there's some research being done showing that if you've got um, soils which are really rich in organic matter, it can take a long time um, for uh, the, the, the new woodland to become um, a net sequesterer of carbon because you lose a lot of soil carbon in those really organic uh, matter rich upland soils, or at least some of them. Um, yeah. I don't know if there are other, any other comments that you'd like yes. to make as well. I mean, as? just from the different, I mean, it's slightly different, but different um, types of farmland that we farm, the rewilding, the, choosing the right um, breed and um, species to graze them is has got to be the key focus as well, because I, you know, the weight of an animal and the impact it can have is, is massive. We saw Rob spoke about it earlier, reducing the size of cattle can have a huge impact. So being very thoughtful around what, what sort of animals are actually grazing that type of land is it's got to be key to it. Yeah, and I think there's a key issue here around, because it might not have worked in the systems that we've used in the past, that doesn't mean to say we can't create systems that work both for animals and biodiversity in the future. Can I just go back to you, Andy, and just see if there's anything else? Yeah, so next one from online. Um, is there an ideal length of productivity for the time a grass lay is most efficient for nutrition and carbon sequestering? Who wants that one? I, I, you could just say no. I can try. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I think in terms of yeah research, I'm not aware of anything. Obviously, yeah, there's there's establishment cost in terms of yeah fuel, diesel. Yeah, there will be lost carbon. Um, productivity. So again, I think, yeah, I, I suppose integrating some of these systems in our arable rotations, I think, yeah, there's there's massive benefits to that um, in terms of, yeah, that fertility building, you know, that disease break. Yeah, you know, we've got massive problems with black grass um, in the UK. So yeah, you know, you're starting to see a lot of arable guys look at livestock as a break. Um, so again. I think it's just broadening out that perspective in terms of, as opposed to just looking at it from a carbon perspective, yeah, the, the additional benefits that a, yeah, a grazing break would bring. Thank you. Um, can I, can I, oh, sorry, go ahead, please, Sophie. Yeah, only, um, and also just looking at, you know, whether it does actually need reseeding and um, as I expect you guys as well, measuring grass, like knowing the productivity of that, of, of it actually so we're not having to turn it over every time so just using methods we've gone to using a direct drill and stitching things in and um, rather than having to you know we were reseeding as as part of a rotation not really looking at what was in the field before choosing it um, so yeah just being a bit more innovative about how you do it I think we can be a bit more flexible just very briefly you know because Carl emphasized it and it's it's about bare soil isn't it we, we you know, bare soil is, is the danger, you know, the work coming out of the Northwick Farm Platform showing the loss of topsoil and, and, and erosion risk, you know, let's get it covered. Thank you. Um, so just to let you know, I'm kind of in the middle of the Spanish Inquisition here. I've got a really, really bright light in front of me, so I might not be able to see you. No one expected that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, sorry, terrible old reference. Um, but I can see a hand um, right at the back um, who has very patiently 
I'm surprised your arm hasn't fallen off. Oh, thank God, my arm is about to fall off. Thanks, Leslie. Um, Nikki Oxall, Pastor for Life. I just want to extend my thanks to the panel for a fantastic, uh, just absolutely brilliant session so far. Um, your eloquence in the debate is just much needed. And so firstly, a big thank you. Um, just, yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant job. Um, bit of a niche question, probably for you, Michael. Um, one of the challenges that we're seeing within the research space is that particularly from, um, from UKRI, from Research UK, there's definitely a focus on more intensive, I would say, and kind of um, input required research and action research. Um, however, what we are seeing is, and from some of the panel's um, evidence today, is that lower input systems are actually the things that potentially are going to really help move this forward and help us to create a more sustainable ruminant livestock future. Yet the requirement for funding is one that gives us a product or something to sell at the end or that is quite high tech. I'd be really interested to hear from you and also Robert, your thoughts on that and the challenges that we have as an agroecological livestock uh, sector to make sure that the evidence base is there that you're calling for, but that it isn't being outcompeted or in terms of the funding by those that are looking for more intensive, um, higher input uh, research projects. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for throwing me under the bus in terms of potential funders. Um, <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think um, it, it is challenging within research at the moment to get, to get funding, particularly within in UKRI. And they very much are looking at impact and pipeline and therefore possibly some of the sy more systems orientated to, to immediate outputs and, and returns. Um, as you know, there's been some phenomenal amount of research into archaeal suppressants. Uh, the challenges we'll have, of course, to include them within grazing systems, where we're looking for more natural, plant-based, um, antihelminthic um, and, and um, archaeal suppressants. Um, I, I think working with industry is critical. Um, I, I know Ken's in the audience and AHDB have a, a key role to play um, in aligning that, as do also the new um, Agritech Catapult um, and, and emphasising the role that we have within uh, grazing lands and looking at land use. I think feeding into government critically and there is more cross-council work, so NERC and BBSRC working more together to realise land-based solutions and think about this wider, um, so looking at food systems, environment, more holistic area. Um, I've been lucky enough to represent the UK on ATF. Uh, ATF is the Animal Task Force. Um, it feeds into Brussels um, and the EU uh, government policy. Now I know, post-Brexit, we're not directly related to the EU government policy. However, I'm delighted to say we are in Horizon Europe. Um, and the significant research potential, particularly within agroecology, uh, for um, in Horizon Europe um, and I'm working on a bid at the moment with European partners and, and really em emphasising the critical role that the UK and Ireland uh, have uh, with it within, within these systems. So I think we need to continue the message and dialogue with funders and if you haven't read our report, um, the School of Sustainable Food and Farming's report on the application of science to realise a just agricultural transition, you'll see some of the key recommendations we put into government and a huge thanks to Lord Curry to, for putting those forward to ministers about the challenges we have within agricultural um, research funding, um, because I think that's critical. So thank you. And hopefully any funder in the, in, in the, in the room or listening um, know that I, I love them dearly. <laughs> um, we have more hands than we have time. Um, and I'm so sorry if you don't get a chance to ask a question because I can see at least 10 hands up at this point in time just in the room, let alone online. Um, so I just wanted to say a couple of things. Firstly, um, this is the start of a longer conversation this year around the role of grazing livestock. And it's not just about the warming world, which is of key importance, but also the role of grazing livestock in nutrition, for example. Um, and other factors um, that we've talked about here in terms of environmental impact communities, animal welfare and so on, that we'll be bringing to the conversation. Um, so just to, to say we will have um, the report coming out in spring, but also um, we hope that we will have further events through the year and opportunities to address this, I hope not least at Groundswell, but elsewhere. 
Um, and I would really seriously um, uh, welcome, if you're interested to be part of that conversation, to reach out to myself or Robert at the Sustainable Food Trust um, as we, we take that work forward to be part of that conversation. Um, so we've got room for, for one more question. And, and I have, I, so I'm going to choose it on the biggest smile that somebody's giving me at the moment, which is, which is this lovely person in the front. So we're, we're um, organic pasture supply farmers from southern Scotland. And um, Scottish Government are funding carbon audits based on SAC's AgriCalc. We haven't updated a carbon audit that we had done in 2018, but a neighbour has, and he showed me the results of his carbon audit. And, and this relates, Michael, to your point about the national inventory. So the carbon audit that was undertaken took into account the carbon burden or emissions of the whole farm business, including the diversification on that farm. What it didn't do is segregate the results of diversification enterprise carbon, but put it onto the livestock. So the result of that carbon audit was flawed because it included diversification of business. So I just wondered, that's troubling, and I'm wondering what comments you might have on agriculture, which is so widely used and evidently producing information that is not strictly reliable. It's a really interesting question, just from the point of view that, of uh, the Food Data Transparency Partnership, is that what it's called, from DEFRA, um, who are currently trying to look at what's the carbon calculator that people should use. Mm. So it's a very timely point. Thank you. Does anyone have a thought, Carl? Oh, Carl, I can't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we've done a lot of work with a lot of different carbon calculators out there. I think in the UK, there's probably yeah 70 plus different carbon calculators out there. I think the research would suggest by entering the same information into those carbon calculators, you get about a 35% spread in results. So again, yeah, those questions about the inventory, where they they pull in the information from, I think. Again, the carbon calculator has been part of the problem that we've talked about today, that they're very good at looking at emissions. Um, so we've got very good data on cattle emissions. So they give you a very accurate picture around that, not so good around sequestration. Um, so they, they tend to tell one half of the story without telling the other part of the story. Um, I think AgriCalc tends to be the one that I think a lot of the retail sector are, are using. Um, and I think, yeah, and we've definitely had audits, and, it's, and again, it's been interesting for us. Um, yeah, we looked at our outdoor system, so keeping cows outside versus bringing them in. And the suggestion from the carbon calculator was that the cows that were outside all year round um, had a larger carbon footprint than the cows that were brought in over winter. And then we, we unpicked that a little bit and, a lot, and some of that came down to manure management. So I, I said to the auditor, I said, well, if those cows are outside all year round. Of course, they defecate and ur urinate on the ground. I said, for those cows that we bring in, I've, I've got to buy straw from a local farm. I said, we've got to transport that. We've got to store it on farm. We've then got to take it out the shed. We've then got to spread it. Um, we then got to take it back out the shed again. Uh, we've got to put it in a heap. Then I've got to get a muck spreader. I've got to tip it in the muck spreader. They then tip it on the land or spread it on the land where the cow was doing that in the first place. And you're telling me that that has a lower carbon footprint. <laughs> so that's what we're dealing with. It's one of those spaces where you can use the word perverse yes. quite realistically. So, right, we've got three minutes left. Um, and I would dare to say, sorry, Michael, I would just dare to say, um, I don't know if you'll be around after this um, during the break, but I, I hope you have the chance to engage with um, the speakers um, during that, that time um, or obviously afterwards. Um, in our last couple of minutes, I just wanted to ask all of you if there was one thing that you wanted people to take away from this session and you've got 20 seconds to tell us what it is, um, what would you want people to take away? Who wants to go first? Go on. Sure, go that way. 
Um, I mean, I guess the, the multifunctional role of, of grazing animals reared appropriately is absolutely key. They're, we're not just talking about a, a food production system. They're producing fiber, leather, but you know, all of the ecosystem services that grazing livestock, quote, when reared in an appropriate way, deliver the social benefits, some of which Sophie mentioned as, as well. Um, I think the other thing which Richard talked about in his video at the start was just the kind of the paramount importance of animal welfare in, the, in, in all of these conversations when we're talking about sentient beings. That's absolutely key. Thank you. Michael? I'm just going to answer that carbon footprint one as okay. well. Carbon calculator. Uh, look on the AHDB website in terms of the six point guide in choosing a carbon calculator. Some really great information uh, there. And I, I totally agree we need to improve tier one carbon sequestration in soils. So going back to the research point, uh, we need to, 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 to really, really invest in that. And Northern Ireland is doing it. And that's an issue that we've got with devolution across the UK. Different governments are doing different things. In terms of the one thing that I'd take away, actually, it goes back to one of the points Sophie made, and you, you thank the scientists. We should really be thanking the farmers because you are the custodians of the land. And I think it's a point that you made, um, which is critical, because if we're ever going to win this, um, this argument, this discussion, the truth, although scientists shouldn't trust, go for truth, we challenge hypotheses, is to get young people involved and to see farms. So I say that's, that's amazing. It's exactly what you need to do. It's what you all need to do, and I know a lot of you do it, is to get society understanding about agriculture, food production, grazing livestock. Because then, once they're informed, they won't be easily switched from an ideological incorrect narrative thrown to them by our national broadcaster. So please continue that, and thank you. Sophie. Um, well, actually very much leading on from yours to just encourage any of you to open your farm gates to kids, to adults, to anyone to just showcase what you're doing. Um, also to put pressure on government to put food farming and the environment back on national curriculum because these kids need to understand where their food's from and it's just have lasting impact through NHS, through everything. So I just would encourage you all, if that's one thing you do, is go and speak to your MP, just put pressure on because we need this back. It's, yeah, it's not non-negotiable now. And I would, I would really give a shout out to the Beacon Farms project that Sustainable Food Trust is building, which is very much around engaging people like Sophie um, uh, to bring together people who wouldn't otherwise experience um, far, you know, farms and farming and what it's really about um, with these amazing regenerative farmers. Cole? Uh, I was gonna say the same, but I'll say something different. Uh, I think if you're farming, I think yeah, the opportunity around you know, massively improving productivity, um, you know, implementing rotational grazing, regenerative grazing, massive benefits that, that that brings. If you know somebody that's doing it, whether that's a neighbor, go and talk to them. You know, go and talk to them, ask them what they're doing. Join a group, you know, get information. You know, it's, it, it's an amazing, system to be involved with and provides so much opportunities which then allows us to talk about the great things that we're doing. Thank you. Patrick, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to say as a close out here and I'm mindful that I'll get killed if we run over. Uh, thank you. Um, I do want to say something. Um, Richard, uh, a great friend of his said to me yesterday, Richard was a, a champion of underdogs. And in a way, it was, it, I was reflecting during this conversation that we, our position on the role of uh, livestock in truly sustainable farming and food systems has been a bit of an underdog. And I think we've had the most brilliant discussion. I think you've, you've been amazing. And I just want to particularly, uh, Richard's in the room, by the way. He's with us. Uh, that, was the, that was the other thing his friend said, he's around. And so he's listening, champion of underdogs. I think he will have witnessed, particularly you, Michael. I just think there was a mo moment of Michael speaking, what he said earlier that got the applause. It was as if there was a bridge moment and uh, the cause of livestock in the way that they need to form a, a central part of the agriculture of the future, I think took a big step forward this morning. So thank you very much, particularly Michael, but to all the brilliant panelists.
So as I said, this is just the start of the conversation. Please do reach out to us at Sustainable Food Trust. The report will be coming out. We want to have this conversation going forward. And yes, huge thanks. And please do engage with our incredible experts and practitioners who are here. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for being part of the conversation.